Hello everyone, this is Chrononauts. We are back again. It is the end of September. I'm JM and I'm here with Nate as always. And I hope everyone is doing well. We are approaching the autumn time here and things are kind of cool. And I just had to close the windows because there's a ton of kids playing outside <laughs> that would be interfering with our podcast right now if you could hear them. Yeah, right. And they're not home doing math, which maybe is what they should be doing. Right. But before we get into that, I just wanted to say welcome everyone to the podcast. And if you haven't listened to us before, we are a science fiction literature history podcast. And we have a few things on the web. You can hear us at Anchor and all the usual podcasting platforms. We also have a blog spot, which is pretty important because we actually post a lot of things there, including first translations and first true digitized editions of certain works. We have something that is on the blog spot that we will be covering today, actually, and there will be more next month. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to visit the blog spot, which is chrononautspodcast.blogspot.com. And uh, you can find all kinds of things there. And of course, we also welcome any comments and feedback that you might have. Probably leave the lows on just about all of our platforms. And without further ado, I think that today we're going to cover a topic that is sort of the bane of my existence, and that is mathematics. I personally have very little experience with mathematics. It was my worst subject in high school by far. And in recent times, I've kind of tried to improve my math skills because, you know, it just seems like something that would be worth doing. And of course, having certain interests that verge into areas like computer programming and so on, sure. it's kind of something that's always interested me and which I've always had sort of uh, minor knowledge about. Yeah. So it's something that's frustrated me. It also makes me feel like somebody who's really, really good at math is closer to God. <laughs> and we'll be getting to somebody that's like that later yeah, on yeah. in the episode. So we have some really interesting stories to cover. And before we do that, I think uh, I would like Nate to take it away with some basic concepts. Sure. Science can be considered to be the practical application of something that sits on top of a theoretical framework. And that theoretical framework is mathematics. And the literature plays out a little bit differently because I wouldn't say that science fiction literature sits on top of a base of mathematical fiction literature, but it's certainly there. And for this episode, for story selection, we largely drew upon the Mathematical Fiction website, which is maintained by Alex Kassman of the College of Charleston. And this is a very comprehensive website that lists all kinds of stories and novels that deal with mathematics in some fashion. So it includes things like war and peace that one might not necessarily consider to be a work of science fiction, but there is some mathematics in it. So for this episode, we decided to focus on some of the more science fiction-y sounding stories that deal with either theoretical mathematics or some rather interesting practical applications of it, or stories that deal with people who practice mathematics themselves. So the history of mathematics itself is certainly far too long to take from the beginning and could be a podcast in and of itself. It probably is somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> if we find one between now and Thursday, we'll put it up. Right. So yeah. you can go to it. The math podcast. Yeah. But I guess for this, we'll just briefly touch upon some of the major developments and trends through the 19th century. The book that I took a look at for this is Dirk J. Streak's Concise History of Mathematics, Volume 2. The 17th century through the 19th century, published in 1948. And it turns out the history of mathematics through the 19th century isn't very concise at all. So <laughs> we're just going to make this a very, very brief oversimplification without getting too much into the ins and outs and the weeds, because there's really quite a bit of it. And if you're interested in how things really developed in depth throughout the 19th century, I strongly urge you to take a look at this book, as it is quite well written and as concise as it can be for the large amount of development that happens in the 19th century, especially. So the dawn of the century saw mathematics flourishing in France during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic periods, and scientific Latin in general was on the decline, with mathematical and scientific texts 
being more and more written in local national languages. In addition to the language shift, there was an increased specialization in the fields of mathematics versus the physical scientists, as mathematicians found more of a home in a university, academic, or philosophical society rather than the court mathematician. By 1870, mathematics had grown to what Streak describes as, quote, an enormous and unwieldy structure divided into a large number of fields in which only specialists knew the way. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, there were numerous developments in algebra, geometry, set theory, numerical analysis, logic, elasticity, and light, to name a few things, as well as foundational applications of certain types of mathematics, such as the Fourier transform. All of the stories we're reading tonight span the time period from 1873 to 1901. So this is slightly after Streak notes that the mathematics field has grown to an incredibly large size, but before Einstein's theory of relativity, which was first proposed in 1905 and published in 1915, which would open up a whole new dimension and field of mathematical study that would dominate the 20th century understanding of our world. So we don't want to go too much in depth on top of that, but we just want to lay the groundwork here that by 1870, the field was already incredibly, incredibly large, subdivided into numerous fields, and we have many advancements across many forms of mathematics, which would lay the foundation for what would come in the century later. One work that we didn't cover tonight, but felt it interesting enough to mention, is 1879's Euclid and His Modern Rivals by Charles Dodson, better known as Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland. This work sort of serves as a review of contemporary geometry textbooks and recommends how geometry should be taught using the framing device of Euclid's ghost coming back and arguing against these contemporary mathematical textbooks. And it's not really fiction <laughs> in a sense, and it's more of a mathematics text, so we decided not to cover it for that reason, but it sounds strange enough for us to mention before we get into the actual stories that we did read. Makes me wonder why why he thought he needed to put a ghost in it, just yeah. to make it more interesting. Yeah, I, I guess. guess so, yeah. <laughs> it, it's certainly an interesting framework, <laughs> but yeah, it, it really does read more of a mathematics text than any work of fiction. With that out of the way, let's start to get into the stories that we did read tonight. And the first one is quite an interesting one, certainly written by quite a character in the form of Alfred Jarry. this, we are drawing upon Jill Fell's biography, Alfred Jarry, published in 2010, as well as the notes and introduction to the text itself, which is The Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Faust Troll, Pataphysician. Now, before we carry on with that, I'd just like to say, we didn't actually announce that we were going to do this, because right. the plan originally was not to do this whole work. And... A few times before, we have actually used the big book of science fiction edited by Anna and Jeff Vandermeer as material for stories. And there are a lot of good stories in this book. A lot of them. Uh, but I learned a few things about the book while doing this. And that is that for some of the early works, they have a tendency to excerpt things rather than include the entire work. And right. Sometimes you can see some sense behind this. And maybe they just really wanted to include something from Jarry in here. but Initially reading Elements of Pataphysics, which is what we said we were going to be covering today, I found it extremely obtuse and difficult to really say anything about because yeah, it had I no agree. context whatsoever. Right. right. 
And this isn't the only time they've done this in the book. They actually have another story. Uh, we'll be getting to Abraham Merritt at some point, but I don't know if we're going to do this story. But they have the story, The Last Poet in the Robots, which is in the book, is actually also excerpted from another longer work yeah. by several different authors, actually. Right. And there is a version by Merritt alone, but for some reason they didn't use that one. So they could have actually used another source for their story, and for some reason they chose to use the excerpt instead. And I don't really know the reasoning behind that. No. So great work. If people want to get this book, I uh, highly recommend it. Just be aware that you're getting a couple of things like that, especially in the earlier years, because it starts around 1890, late 1890s with H.G. Wells and goes on a bit. So, yeah. So we decided that we were going to read the whole work because it's not that long mm -hmm. and because it really does help makes sense or as much sense as can possibly be made of what's coming yeah because elements of pataphysics doesn't really work as a standalone excerpt and that's no. one of the things where you know it's like why did they do that in the first place i mean i've yeah. seen some anthologies like some ghost story anthologies which will take like a chapter of dickens from pickwick papers which is like a totally isolated story that you don't yeah need that, that can kind of work yeah but, but this, for, no, yeah, right. for something like this, it really is kind of embedded in the core of the novel. And right. reading it without that context, it just feels very strange it's and kind of... Mean, kind of meaningless. Even. Yeah. I mean, you could tell that there's some kind of satirization of mathematics and mathematicians and scientists going on. But you don't really get, I guess, the full sense of what's happening. Yeah. My friend Jennifer warned me about this story. She said uh, that she had been reading this book and she found this one completely incomprehensible yeah so i was sort of stealing myself for that <laughs> and it kind of was that and the book itself it's a bit that too but we'll get to that yeah yeah so i would say w regarding the book itself before we get into the biography of jari and the novel is if we could imagine a difficulty scale where one is Harry Potter, and ten is Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> You're and, showing your bias there, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> That's okay, I, I mostly agree. Yeah, yeah, but if we could put most adult genre fiction around like a two or a three, this one I think would rate as high as like a 6.5 or a 7. It's certainly way above the difficulty level of everything we've read in the podcast so far. Pretty much. And it will probably be so going forward, at least for a while. So if you want to check this one out, and I highly recommend you do, because I really like this one, but certainly be prepared for a work that is both challenging and frustrating in places, because he really likes to play with genre, narrative, surrealistic imagery, and a lot of kind of things that I think make it difficult, but ultimately rewarding to get through. Yeah. I'll say, like, I didn't necessarily comprehend it altogether but i really enjoyed reading it nonetheless oh, yeah. uh which i wouldn't say of the elements of pataphysics yeah. part on its own <laughs> that just kind of left me feeling sort of empty and bewildered this yeah. left me feeling satisfied but bewildered if that yeah. makes sense it's certainly a wild ride that's for sure yeah i was gonna say i actually did find that the introduction explaining a few things helped a lot yeah it definitely did <laughs> yeah. so yeah so the person who wrote this was also quite the character himself Alfred Jarry was born on September 8, 1873 in Laval, and had an older sister, Charlotte, who played the role of caretaker for a good part of his life. After his father's business failed around 1879, his mother moved him and his sister to the Brittany Coast, which was his mother's childhood home, while his father remained elsewhere conducting business on various trade routes and things like that. In his boyhood, Jarry was quite engrossed in his schooling at the Lycée de saint bruc which he attended until 1888, and his physics teacher, one Felix Herbert, would serve as the inspiration for the character of Ubu, that would be the main character of his most famous work. At this young age, he began writing poetry and drama, and this early work he intentionally preserved as he thought that he was going to be an important literary figure and wanted it to remain available for scholars. And the collection was discovered in 1947, decades after his death, but ultimately made available. So one of the things he started to write during this time was an early version of Ubu Roy, which is his most famous work, titled at this time Les Polonais. Him and Charlotte, his sister, moved to Paris in 1891. And while he was recognized as being very intelligent, 
he was perceived as being very strange in an unsettling fashion. And that certainly comes across in his work quite a bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in 1893, he fell gravely ill and was bedridden for 40 days. Nine days after he recovered, his mother died, which had a great effect on him. Despite his illness and his mother's death and the fallout from that, he was incredibly productive in the first half of 1893, writing a number of poems and prose that earned him five literary prizes between February and August of that year. After his mother's death, Jari had a falling out with his father, and the two never reconciled, the father dying shortly after in 1895. In 1894, he started experimenting with woodcut art and produced several illustrated pieces for his poems, and around this time was contributing heavily to various magazines, including pieces on art criticism. And through his work in art, he became friends with and a major champion of the work of Henry Rousseau, who was a painter that was somewhat ridiculed in his time, but has, like Jarry, found more critical appreciation in the years afterwards. Between November of 1894 and December of 1895, he served in the military, which forms the basis for his novel Days and Nights, and continued to write fiction heavily during his time of service. December 9th and 10th of 1896 were the first two performances of Ubu Roy, which was a massive success that put him in the national spotlight, though not without a great deal of difficulty. He had trouble locating a printer for the work and made strict demands on how the play should be performed, which made some theater directors hesitant to work with him, and some of his directions and demands sounded like a real nightmare for the actors to perform, you know, insisting they be rigid like a robot would be, or speaking their lines in these ridiculous voices, but nevertheless performed it was, and while Jarry didn't see a great deal of money from it, his name was at least one that was now widely recognized throughout France. However, his behavior was becoming more and more ridiculous and uncontrollable. He was drinking heavily and had a bit of an ether addiction, which by all accounts just seems like the nastiest stuff out there. Even Hunter S. Thompson was not a fan of it, mm. <laughs> but this led him to be very prone to getting into fights. In 1896, he assaulted Belgian author Christian Beck, which even Jarry's biographer, Jill Fell, is puzzled why he hated him. But nevertheless, he appears in tonight's novel in the character form of a baboon. Like with Ubu Roy and this incident, a great deal of personal animosities and relationships with people he knew would constantly make their way into his novels. His journalistic and nonfiction prose was just as confrontational and abrasive as his personality was. While he certainly made a fair amount of enemies and never really a great deal of money from any of his writings, he was nevertheless quite prolific. But by 1903, the hard drinking as well as the ether abuse caught up with him, and he began to experience bouts with tuberculosis and influenza, though he was still active in society during this time. At a dinner party in 1905, everybody was getting drunk and rowdy except for a Spanish sculptor named Manolo, whose sobriety was annoying Jari, so Jari pulls out his revolver and fires at him, causing two pregnant women there to faint. Rumors were that Picasso was there for this incident and took his gun after his death, but this is likely an embellishment, as Picasso had stated he didn't know Jarry personally, but is a sort of person that he would have liked to know. Yeah. Uh, Jarry thought he would have died at the same age of Christ, at 33, but ended up living one year longer to the age of 34. In October of 1907, he went to the hospital and died two days later on November 1st of the tuberculosis infection which had spread to his brain. And today there is a statue of him in his birthplace of Laval commemorating him. He published five novels in his lifetime and two were published afterwards, uh, including the one we are reading tonight. And a number of plays, including Caesar Antichrist and Ubu Roy, the latter of which is probably his most known work today as well as numerous collections of short stories, prose, and poetry. And he experienced a great deal of critical resurgence in France after World War II. Faustrol, the novel we're looking at tonight, was initially written in 1898. Jarry at the time saying he was writing over everyone's head, including his own, so he'll have to die to catch up to his own level of writing. And indeed, the novel was only published 
posthumously in 1911, and is generally considered to be his most difficult and dense work, which we'll see in a bit. The French author Rabelais was a major influence on Jarry in general, and his major work, Gargantua and Pantagruel, is composed of five books. And in the fourth and fifth book, the characters spend a lot of time going from island to island, and with each place they visit, it's a satire on some different political movement, person, or philosophy. And a lot of the novel's midsection seems much like a homage to this. Rabelais is also incredibly dirty, with constant scatological and sexual jokes throughout his work, which Jarry certainly takes up here in spades, as not only this is one of the most difficult works we've read, it's certainly the dirtiest we've covered on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, we've never really done a dirty book on the podcast yet, yeah. so this is a first. Yeah. In many respects. Yeah, and it is definitely a dirty book. <laughs> That's for sure. The soul is wheedled by love. It looks exactly like an iridescent veil and assumes the masked face of a chrysalis. It walks upon inverted skulls behind the wall where it hides claws of brandish weapons. It is baptized with poison. Ancient monsters, the wall's substance, laugh into their green beards. The heart remains red and blue, violet in the artificial absence of the iridescent veil that is weeping. Since much of the novel is very heavy on a strange, surrealistic style, it might be difficult to give a meaningful summary to, but we'll try anyways. The novel opens up with a quote from the Upanishads that says, quote, There are eight abodes, eight places of sight, eight deities, and eight purushas. And so here we have eight books in this novel. Book one opens up with a very official-looking summons, Written from a Rene Isidore Panmufel. Panmufel? Is that how you think you say it? I guess Panmufel? so. It's, yeah. it's not a real word. It's yeah. not French or anything. It's just some nonsense word. So. Yeah, right. But this Panmufel, <laughs> Panmufel yeah. is a bailiff, and he's sending a writ to a Monsieur Faustrel on February 8th, 1898, to pay due rents on a leased property. Letter was sent through the mail as no other way of serving proved successful. Faustrol, who has been 63 all his life and is in 1898 described in atomic measurements and is bathing with wallpaper instead of water. So already we're getting into the quite surreal elements of the story. He's quite ornately dressed and hangs himself, unsure of whether or not to be a white or blue corpse, and then cuts himself down, putting on a solar toupee. So two days later, another writ comes stating that with the help of a locksmith, they were able to get into Faustrol's apartment, and 27 books have been seized to go towards the debt. And we get a list of said books, and Faustrol is sort of a somewhat, though not one-to-one, -one stand in for Jari himself, and certainly these 27 books are among his personal favorites. So highlights that are in there include the second novel from Bergerac, The Odyssey, of course, Ubu Roy, Rabelais, and Jules Verne's what they refer to as Voyage to the Center of the Earth, not Journey. So even here, it's interesting that we get different titles through translations. Yeah. However, Faustrol's cellar appears to be quite flooded with wine and spirits. On the fourth day of June, another writ comes, this time written to the court. And it notes that the stamped paper of a writ is too small to contain a sufficient account. 
of what Pan Mufel has seen in Faust Troll's house after he got thrown into this boozy-filled cellar, so he needs to attach it by unstamped paper. So here begins the narrative of Pan Mufel. Faustrol begins by talking about surface tension and goes to explain that the bed they are on is not a bed at all, but a boat that is shaped like an elongated sieve. And it's made of this very fine material whose holes in it number about 15 and a half million. And thus it can float like a boat and be laden without sinking. Not only this, but can allow water to pass through the top to the other side, including both urination and waves. So that's quite handy for passengers. The doctor intends to make this boat his house, and it can carry three people, the third of whom will be on their way shortly. Faustrol gives Pan Mufel a book written by him, which might help him understand Faustrol better. And Faustrol appears to have manifested something physical from each of the 27 C's books. Possibly the most relevant for us would be from the Bergerac, a precious tree into which the Nightingale King and his subjects were metamorphosed in the land of the sun. Yeah, I like his take from Ubu Roi as well, which is like one word on the third line or something like that yeah. of the first <laughs> act. <laughs> yeah, there's really a lot of humor in here, and it's it's hard to come across into a summary unless you actually read the thing yourself, which we certainly recommend that you do. But also from our good friend Jules Verne, we get two and a half leagues of the Earth's crust, certainly essential for any traveler. Mm -hmm. Pan Mufel begins to read the book, which takes us into book two, Elements of Pataphysics. So this is one of the portions that were excerpted in the book, big book of SF. Yeah, it actually jumps from book two to like book uh, eight or something yeah, like that. Right, it's not a straight excerpt. Yeah. Yeah. But book two here begins defining an epiphenomenon as that which is superinduced upon a phenomenon. And it sketches out the discipline of pataphysics, or properly pataphysics with an apostrophe in front of it to avoid the simple pun, uh, pat a physique, deliberately calling attention to it by mentioning this in text. But pataphysics is defined as the science that is superinduced upon metaphysics, the science of the particular, something that describes a universe which can be, and perhaps should be, envisaged in the place of the traditional one. Or in other words, it is the science of imaginary solutions. And as an example, Faust Troll desired once to be smaller and to explore the elements. And shrinking himself to molecular size, he encounters a water molecule. The water molecule appears to possess some elastic properties, as when Faustrol taps on it like one might knock on a door, it bounces back to its original form. He decides to push the water molecule into another one, and to his surprise, the two kind of suck each other in and become this sphere twice the size. Faustrol kicks the sphere, and he appears to explode in a shower of tiny molecules, dry and hard as a diamond. So then we're jump back into the real world, or at least as real as it can be, via some sort of omniscient narrator. It's The structure of the book is, again, quite atypical, but we are introduced to our third companion, Bus de Nage, a dog-faced baboon. Not particularly familiar with the French language, though he can say a few things in Belgian. Though the only thing he says is, ha ha, and nothing more. Though certainly enunciated and with different tones, depending on yeah. what's going on. But here we return to Pan Mufel's narration in book three, which is From Paris to Paris by Sea, or The Belgian Family Robinson. Very verne like title. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And this is the part that really is, I think, follows Rabelais' formula of going from place to place and having brief satires on each island, as a lot of people in this novel are caricatures of people that Jari knew personally, both positive and negative people, and a lot of them are encountered in this section. The boat is embarking, apparently on pavement, so it can run on water and land. Pan Mufel is tied into the boat and first encounters a corpse, or an island, which is Baron Hildebrand of the Squiddy Sea, and it's named Squiddy for its unusually large fecal production, and only his brain is dead, and the rest of his body is just running on pure inertia, so the surplus fecal matter that gets ejected has created some sort of island of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> Rather <laughs> gross visual image, Shit and island. he certainly doesn't shy away from these kind of gross-out scenes. Uh, it's 
referred to also as the Island of Cac, and there's some sort of lighthouse of sorts in the form of a leaden blowpipe, which is affluting the Baron's soul. And a number of young pages have found their way there, and there's even a Catholic monastery set up by the elderly, and the whole lot seems to be referred to as shit diggers by the pataphysicians. <laughs> So they leave, and six hours of harsh rowing later, they encounter the King of Lace, who is quite adept at manipulating light in these incredible displays. Bostonage doesn't really understand the show, and they go forward and come across a district where there are numerous monuments of stone, these lewd, pornographic green statues. A random person asks them if they are Christians, and Faustrol says that he is God. Nearby, there is a great party in a barn, and Faustrol offers numerous drinks and desserts and returns with two maps of the country. The country is the Forest of Love. They next encounter a giant black marble pyramid, and the subjects of the kingdom are forced to climb the steps on their hands and knees by the king, where they are dismembered and fed to a tiger. However, the king welcomes them quite cheerfully. The amorphous island is next up. Its ground and trees are quite strange ruled by oligarchs, in which each king has its strange quirks. The Fragrant Isles king is nude, and seems to behave like an ancient Roman, and is in the middle of fixing images of his gods to various objects. There's quite a few erotic scenes, coupled with the formula of happiness being be amorous, be mysterious. The king is playing the zither, and as they're leaving, the king's wife is chasing away this guy who has no legs, and he falls, attempting to make a jump of some sort in a rather humorous fashion. Faustrol says that they are near northeast Paris. The sky seems to be mirroring what is on the ground, and here they encounter a strange palace, a junk, as in the type of ship, and after they drink with the king and leave, disappears and reappears in the mirrored sky. They encounter the island of Ptix, fashioned from a single block of stone, also called Patix, which is also only found there. The king hands them four eggs, which surrealistically hatch into a triumphal arch. The Isle of Her is also one single formation, a jewel, and its surface is a mirror-like still water, only traversable by the sort of skiff that they are currently in. The conduct in the land is quite formal, presumably not to disturb the surface of the water. The king of the island is a cyclops, with two silvered mirrors hanging from his forehead chain. This allows him to see ultraviolet lights hidden from the human eye, and at the sight of the clogs and skirts of his female retainers, they are put into a fright and leave. They approach the island of Cyril, which appears to be a volcano, but also a pirate ship and it fires on them, hits Bostinage, tearing off his right ear and four of his teeth. Faustrol is able to convince the pirate captain not to kill them and take all their stuff, and they're able to see the interior of the volcano, blindingly red, with its inhabitants never growing old. After drinking with the captain, the captain carves Bostinage, Papio Sinocephalus's, and poor Bostinage's head with his sword, and has the light children escort them away. Yeah, so Bostinage is always getting abused, like, yeah. one way or another. Um, <laughs> Faustro uses him to climb on several times, and then he uses his head to lubricate certain parts of the ship. Because I guess he has, like, he's, like, hydrocephalic, so yeah. he's always got, like, liquid coming out of his head or something, I guess. So they use, them. <laughs> they just, like, use his body for various purposes, and mostly, I guess, he doesn't mind. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, say. you can tell Jerry didn't really like this Christian Beck writer who <laughs> he's based yeah. off of. And the notes of the text that we read go into a fair amount of detail on both the epigrams at the beginning of the chapter and who some of these people Jarry is caricaturing. A lot of them are contemporary French symbolist authors who I was largely unfamiliar with, yeah. but it's nice to have this reference. And due to the sheer density of the text, it's definitely something I can envision going back to at a later date when I have more familiarity with that sort of literary scene. Yeah, I think it's most... I mean, there are authors, but also artists and painters. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mentioned in there. So so there's a, the whole slew of people, actually, that yeah. 
mostly I've never heard of. A couple of names sort of ring a bell, like <laughs> Aubrey Beardsley, for instance, yeah. and uh, a few others, but yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the difficulties of this work is the, the density of the references in a similar fashion to something like Dante, where he really does throw a lot of caricatures at you. But next stop on the way is the Snot Figs Cathedral, where Father John is preaching this rhetorical sermon. And as he's speaking, he's shot in the head, blowing his skull wide open, but leaving the brain undamaged and exposed. The congregation starts spewing steam from their mouths, which forms a squat monster at the pulpit, the snout. Friar John draws his sword to attack the snout, and they decide to leave when the fight commences, but the friar hacks up the monster's rear end quite a bit, and after defeating it, Friar John resumes his sermon, with the congregation now purged of all their crass humor, because you can't have any of that. <laughs> no, you got to leave some room for Shari. Exactly. And his crass humor. <laughs> <laughs> the Ring Isle, which they come to next, is fortified by bamboo and contains a great deal of musical plants which form the ecosystem. They drink distilled wormwood and sing together, with the king quite pleased at their song. And it I guess should be noted that pretty much every time they go to one of these new islands, they always have a pretty heavy drinking session. Yeah, which a lot no of doubt, drinking in this. Yeah, no doubt yeah. Jerry was fond of in his personal life, too. They pass the river ocean and arrive at the land of the Kimmery in the Hermetic Shades, where the horizon meets the sky, where this giant toad, whose mouth is flush with the ocean, is devouring the setting sun. And when the sun rises, it comes out the toad's other end, the toad occupying the space of this giant subterranean cavern under the earth and each night the king here awaits death and believes that night will sometime become eternal and is in constant state of inquiry over the state of the toad's bowel movements but the party arrives in total darkness but fortunately day comes again with the toad expulsing fire out of its colon and here we get into book four cephalurgy so faustrol and his crew leave the king before the toad brings the day. And as he's more concerned with the ebb and flow of the Earth's tides, the Earth is functioning more like some sort of organic body with the moon, as in the crust of the Earth and the, the land not normally thought to move with the tides like the same way the ocean would. Faustrol takes some mathematical measurements, and at midday, they arrive at the house of the Rue de Venise. They see a marine bishop, one whose mitre is of fish scales. His cross is like the corum of a tentacle, and his chasuble is encrusted with deep sea stones. This is the marine bishop, Mendacious, who asks them if it would be agreeable for them to drink. And they have a bit of a feast here, though the bishop seems to be enjoying only water and rat piss. He used to eat condiments, but has since suppressed the vanity of this sort of behavior. He asks Faustrol if he thinks a woman could ever be naked, and concludes that naked women are never naked. Uh, so it's a rather humorous dialogue here. So a bunch of a bunch of non sequiturs. Yeah, like, they just sort of go from thing to thing without any connective tissue. So yeah. it's it's funny, but it's really hard to follow. Yeah, like, it can be bewildering at times for sure. Yeah, <laughs> the bishop offers them lobster at the time which was thought of as a dirty, lower-class food, and relates this fable comparing the lobster to a can of corned beef around Faustrol's neck. And yeah, yeah, he always carries this corned beef can. <laughs> Very nouveau art. Yeah. Uh, sort of. It's full of corned beef, by the yeah, way. Yeah, right, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fully functional. The book smells funny, too. Yeah. <laughs> but so, in this fable, yeah. the can of corned beef is a woman, and she's love-stricken by the male lobster. And she comments on their similarities and that they're both enclosed in this hard shell, as well as boneless and economical, and muses that if the lobster would just join her in the shop window, they'd be decorated with several gold medals. Falstro responds and seemingly changes the subject, and that an unconscious murder isn't necessarily motiveless, and he himself hasn't had the desire to kill, except after seeing a horse head. Now, this isn't a head of a horse attached to a live horse, but rather in disembodied severed head, which he says the sight of an ugly object provokes ugly deeds. And as ugliness is evilness, the horse head is the ugliest object in the world, only equaled by a grasshopper. But since a horse head is of much larger size, is also of much greater severity. 
since he's only referring to a decapitated head, this is why he doesn't go on a murderous spree in the street every time yeah. he sees horses walking up and down the avenue. But the bishop says that he'll consider his murderous tendencies an agreeable paradox as long as they are not in the presence of a severed horse head. And he sends them to bed with this coarse pun in nonsense Greek. The bishop leads them through various streets, and no passers-by realize that Faustrol is unhooking these shop signs and giving them to Bostonage to, I guess, carry around or some reason. But unfortunately, they come up to a horse butcher shop, and Faustrol burns a candle for seven days. And here begins a great mass murdering spree. Day one reveals the poison in the air, and we see the death of all the scavengers and the soldiers. Day two, it's the women that die. Day three, the children. Day four, the edible quadrupeds with a cloven hoof. Day five, it's the cuckolds and the bailiff clerks, though not pan Mufel, as he is of a superior grade. On day six, the bicyclists go. Day seven, the light of the candle changes to smoke. And Faust Roll goes into this murderous rage. He tears off the bishop's mitra and strangles Bostonage, who just says his signature phrase of ha-ha. And after his death, we get an analysis of the phrase ha-ha, with the H rarely being written in ancient languages. So more appropriate to use the two letters A-A as a substitute for the four letter H-A-H-A as the instance of ha and given the reflexive property of A is equal to A, pronounced quickly, the two letters become one. Pronounced slowly would be the idea of duality, echo, and symmetry. And it's significant that he says ah ah instead of ah ah ah, which would denote the trinity or various other significances of threes. So after this music, we go into book five, officially. The bishop, without his mitre, goes to the toilet, and inside the bathroom, the legless man we encountered earlier is there and offers him some paper which he had intended for his mother to use. So after some more humorous banter, he jumps into the bottom of the abyss, and the bishop has this really rather extended defecating scene. The valve at the neck of the pits below is the mouth of this very reverberant rubber which acts as a sort of audio amplifier. So the defecation sounds that the bishop is making from above are pumped into the streets like music. Oh, and oh, we hear the voices of women arise, glorifying the musician in song. <laughs> so it's a real scatological orchestra here. Yeah. Faustrol is subfumigating and gives the ghost of Bostonage instructions to buy canvas. Uh, it's, it seems like death is... Not the end for really anybody in this story, no. but he has instructions to buy canvases, giving him ludicrous sums of money in various currencies. And he reveals that he has the Philosopher's Stone that can transmute any substance. And upon returning uh, them with the canvases, Henry Rousseau then paints them. And then we go into book six, A Visit to Lucullus. So a Faust role is now with Visited. I'm not exactly sure how that appears in the French. It seems like an odd name for a woman. I don't know if it well, appears. Well, the others have odd names too. Like Yeah, um, yeah I guess that's true. His two sons are distinguished and extravagant. So yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if in the, the French it sounds more feminine, but either way, it's a kind of obvious. I don't think, so. well, I guess it could be because it could be the feminine form yeah. of the verb, but it would just have an E on the end. Like it would actually be pronounced the yeah. same. Yeah, yeah. But they I just look different. Yeah, so, the the yeah. names that are puns are always kind of difficulty when it comes to the translation. But Faustrol is with her, the daughter of the bishop, visited. And they're sleeping together in a great carved bed. So visited wakes up and has sex with Faustrol and appears to die during so. Meanwhile, the painting machine that Faustrol had created and provided all these canvases for is now running around aimlessly just spraying paint everywhere with the rather obscene metaphor of comparing it with ejaculate. It says it's ejaculating onto the walls of yeah. its universe. Right. <laughs> so I didn't get, was that supposed to be Henry Rousseau was the painting machine? I think so. And okay. I believe the universe is supposed to be the museum at Luxembourg. Okay. 
I wasn't familiar with Rousseau too much before looking into uh, this novel, and I looked at a few of his paintings, and he does have a very striking style, though it's certainly not typical of a lot of other French painters that I've seen at the time, so I could see why he wouldn't be really taken seriously as a painter, or at least not in the culture and art circle that was around yeah. at the time. Even though it's not really a narrative, the little like prose poems of the different paintings was like probably one of my favorite. Uh, I yeah, parts I, of I, the I book. totally agree. Yeah. It was really so cool. <laughs> we get maybe, I don't know, a dozen or so pictures. There's thirteen which, of them. Yeah, there's thirteen. So yeah. there's largely biblical scenes and they're described in depth, including several depictions of hell Lucifer and witches, as well as some pastoral scenes and depictions of paradise. And you'll probably hear one coming up later when we do one of the breaks here. But yeah, it's what really one of the best parts of the book. They didn't really have to do with the overarching narrative, but it really showcases just how good he is at painting these really surrealistic images that just kind of stick with you in a unsettling way sometimes. But yeah. I think his pro style is, is really quite excellent. I think the reason why I like this part so much too is because I I felt like it was sometimes a chore to try and keep up with the narrative, yeah, like the normal right. narrative. Like even you summarizing certain things here, they're gone over so quickly that oh, I don't yeah. even remember, I yeah. don't really remember them, yeah. right? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of glad that I didn't have to do this part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, so, it, it is uh, a, a tough work and it is one that would no doubt benefit with multiple readings over the course of time and it is very short altogether even though it does cram a lot in there i think the entire work is like twenty two thousand words the translation yes, we read not counting the notes in the introduction i think run about a hundred pages so while it's a dense hundred pages it's not terribly long but the last painting described here the doctors and the lover describes four doctors the fourth of which is observing the lover who is praying the daily prayer of Kermakum, which is book seven. The sieve that carries Pan Mufel and Faustrol is saved from its destruction of the seven-day murder spree, and Faustrol instructs Pan Mufel to row while he avoids numerous pieces of debris in the current by maneuvering into an aqueduct. And here is where the narrative Pan Mufel abruptly ends. And in a rather surrealistic scene, Faustrol scrapes the paraffin off the bottom of the boat, and the ship gets sucked into the water, trying to avoid some of this debris. And Faustrol prays the Kormakum as he dies. I guess this is like the fourth or fifth time he's died so far in the book. Mm -hmm. He seems to do this quite a bit. But the marine bishop finds the wreck of the ship and the corpses of both Faustrol and Panmufel, as well as the manuscript. There's a piece there about how, with noting a fragment of the beautiful, one could from this fragment extrapolate the entirety of art and science. So this has the bishop thinking back to something that a professor Cayley said, that a single curve two and a half meters long could detail all kinds of information, and thus Faustrol is unrolled. And like a musical score, the entirety of art and science is written across the curvature of his limbs, the book revealed by God concerning the glorious truth. So when Faustrol said earlier that he is God, this is most likely what he meant. And I thought this was an interesting part because it's another issue that I was not certain of whether it was a deliberate translation issue of Faustrol being a both portamento of Faust and Troll as well as both being a portamento of Faust and Roll. Yeah. I, I didn't look in the original French to see what the word was for him being unrolled, but I thought that was a, a rather clever way of doing it, um, if it was intentional. It must have been. It yeah. Must have been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's certainly a very bizarre scene, like many others in the book. But meanwhile, Faust Roll's soul is no longer occupying his body, but instead, Book 8, The Eternity. So here's where the elements of pataphysics excerpt from the big book of SF resumes. Here in the form of a telegraphic letter, Faust Roll sends Lord Kelvin after death and mm -hmm. notes that he isn't in fact dead and that death is really only for common people and that he's just somewhere else, not on earth. He's found himself in the unfortunate state of being without a body. 
his perspective on space and time are all off and had foreseen issues of the passing of large amounts of years which would affect the solar system's position so he had made a precise timekeeping device to keep in his pocket but with all this gone he's lamenting i no longer even had my tuning fork imagine the perplexity of a man outside time and space who has lost his watch and his measuring rod and his tuning fork i believe sir that it is indeed this state which constitutes death however he remembers kelvin's teachings and is able to generate some light and with this light he's able to measure a centimeter with it so this puts him in somewhat more satisfactory of a state of being and he relays some impressions of eternity or eternity as he more appropriate calls it as it is in the image of an immobile ether one that is not luminiferous uh, so luminiferous ether he describes as a more circularly mobile system and it together with all material particles forms a system that conforms to various contemporary physicists and the mathematicians of the time though he remarks he might be able to devise a more efficient medium than the luminiferous ether and this theory of ether permeating the entire universe is something that some of the physicists not necessarily well i guess maybe on the fringe would be a appropriate way to describe it but people like metaphysicians yeah <laughs> but also people like oliver lodge and people that oh, were yeah. spiritualist and believed in this kind of life after death were searching for evidence of an ether and while it doesn't exist it serves as a nice pun with both eternity here as well as the substance that jerry was, yeah, I was just to, thinking like uh, that, that yeah. the, the, the stuff that he liked to huff yeah right right so yeah. yeah in a second letter to lord kelvin he describes the sun as being a cool solid homogeneous globe with its surface divided into meter squares that form the base of pyramids who extend about seven hundred thousand kilometers to the center their point being exactly one kilometer from the sun's center Using a brass wheel, Faustrol is able to reachieve measurement there on the sun. And with some commentary on the mechanics of the sun, he wishes he'll soon regain his other senses, but for now is able to glimpse perpendicularly into the sun. And then we get a dialogue between two people. Ibicrates, the geometer, student of Sophratados, the Armenian, and Mathetes, which were translated by Faustrol. So Mathetes wants to know Hippocrates' thoughts on love, as he has deciphered great metaphysical knowledge. And Mathetes comments on how all philosophers have incarnated love into beings, and there is some commentary on the sexual nature of the binary, and that the plus or the male and the minus or the female cancel each other out to become egg or zero. A third sign is described, which is the club or the Holy Ghost in four directions, also reversed as an erect Lucifer or the tau cross or a phallus and Mathetes asked if love may still be considered god Hippocrates describing the tetragon of sophratados inscribing within itself another tetragon half the size with evil being a symmetrical reflection of good the tetragon being thus hermaphroditic engendering god by interior intuition and evil also hermaphroditic engendering childbirth Another fragment, which is resumed in the excerpt in the big book of SF, states that God and the soul are trigonal and trihedral, that man is the tetrahedral because his souls are not independent, and that man is a solid and God is a spirit. It goes on to say that if souls are independent, then man is God, and the three-thirds of the number three that is represented by man, God and the two together, have a short dialogue where man says, the three persons are the three souls of God, God says in Latin. The three souls are the three persons of men, and together they say, man is God. The final chapter of the book describes the surface of God, who is by definition dimensionless, but can be endowed with any number greater than zero. So here, two is used for the convenience of describing it on a flat piece of paper. God is signified by a triangle three persons neither its angles or its sides but rather three apexes 
of another equilateral triangle around the traditional one, confirmed by an Anna Katharina Kendrick, who saw the cross as a Y, a letter which is a sort of inversion of the triangle, with three equal Leiden segments convening on a single point. As such, God has the shape of three lines of length A, 120 degrees apart, assigning variables to the persons, and taking this geometric construction, we're treated to a mathematical definition of God, in that God is the shortest distance between zero and infinity in either direction, so it's plus or minus God, though it's more appropriate to use the plus to that of the subject's own faith. But since God is dimensionless, and this would make God a point, not a line, meaning God is the tangential point between zero and infinity. And the book ends with one final sentence. Pataphysics is the science, trailing off with an ellipses. An ambiguously phrased and worded sentence, which the notes of the book say is the one final pataphysical mystery. Wow. So that brings us to the end of Faust Roll and his various adventures. And this was one hell of a wild ride, I have to say. <laughs> And I'm really glad we got the opportunity to read the full text of this versus just the excerpt in the big book of yeah. SF. We kind of just decided in the last week that yeah. we were wanting to read this. So it was sort of a last minute decision. And if anybody was preparing by reading material, they probably didn't get this. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think everybody will like this. No. I really don't, actually. But if all that sounds appealing to you, and if you like really surreal strange stuff that makes you feel a little bit that you might be huffing something yeah <laughs> you read this read this yeah it's not very long uh funny that 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 summary was very dense but like you said just the a book moment is ago, very dense yeah the book is not very long yeah. so he actually packs a lot into not very many pages so it's yeah. easy to miss parts of the narrative but it's almost okay if you do because i wouldn't really say necessarily that this is a story about progression from a to b to c yeah there's not a lot of logic underpinning the no. linearity of the events in fact it flies in the face of logic and i think Pretty it much, deliberately yeah. does that and i think his using this like nightmarish surrealistic fever dream type imagery allows him to really exaggerate and ridicule elements of french artistic society that for whatever reason he was fed up with that day and i think yeah. you're very much right that not a lot of people may like this or certainly not for everybody when i was looking at reviews of this on goodreads there are like with a lot of works like this mm -hmm. a pretty good split between five star reviews and one star reviews oh yeah and i can totally see why somebody yeah. wouldn't like it because yeah. it frustrates pretty much every attempt to pin it down every attempt to, to make sense of it i mean you did a really good job just now Oh, thank you. You know, and the <laughs> the person that wrote the introduction, Roger Shatuk, who wrote the introduction, does a pretty good job of uh, sort of elucidating the very general points as well. Yeah. He doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it actually really helps to just sort of figure out what's going on yeah, sometimes. Yeah, right. Some kind of basis and groundwork. Yeah. Yeah. But the notes of this edition, the 1996 edition that was published by Exact Change, and it was translated by Simon Watson Taylor and has the introduction, as you said, by Roger Shattuck. And Taylor's notes are really, really thorough. And I think Shattuck notes that since the notes are so thorough, it's almost more readable in this English edition than it would be if you would have read a French edition. Yeah, because those editions are not annotated. Right, and apparently are riddled with typos and like poor formatting. And some of them don't even exist as a standalone work. They're like shoved in an anthology somewhere. So I imagine that original French readers were actually very frustrated. And oh, sure. Yeah. That that's why this book has such a difficult reputation yeah. among the works of a rather difficult person. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Ubu Hua is definitely sort of more well-known. I mean, I don't actually know a ton about the play, but of course there's the great band, Père yeah. Ubu. Right. And they obviously are very, very inspired by Jari. Like, they even have one of their later albums from the 2000s that, like, actually almost feels like an Alfred Jerry play yeah. in itself. So, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> he's had an influence, uh, oh, certainly. Yeah. yeah, and certainly that's part of his legacy, and it has an interesting legacy. So one thing I thought was really cool is that in 1948, 
three authors, Raymond Quinu, Jean Guenet, and Eugene Ionesco, founded the College of Pataphysics with Baustrel as the permanent head and Bostinage as his assistant. And the college continues to this day where it's a sort of I guess, home for these kind of strange yeah. avant-garde writers. It's really funny because it has such an official designation. Yeah. And the, like, <laughs> the writer of the introduction said that they were very helpful to him and all this stuff. Yeah. But really, it's just a fancy fan fiction community, yeah. I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's been going on for almost 80 years now. And yeah. I, I think that's, like, really, really cool that a novel this strange and this dirty has such an endearing legacy. Yeah, definitely. My interest has certainly peaked to check out some of his other works. Certainly the play Ubu Roy and some of his other novels sounded interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And the short stories. Yeah, the notes say they're a bit more easy to get through. Yeah, I mean, I did I did find, like, I had to be in the mood to read this, and luckily yeah. I kind of was, but, like, yeah. you know, it, just, it was just kind of nice after being a little disappointed with the excerpt and frustrated and yeah. then just trying to come back to it and go, ah, oh, that's where it fits in, you know? Yeah, I mean, right. I, I don't know, I mean, I... I I think that in another state of mind, I might have sort of thrown it aside and just been like, I can't do this, you know. <laughs> but for some reason, it, it sort of worked for me. I mean, I, I like the, I, sometimes I like the idea of things as strange as this more than actually reading them. Yeah. Like it's, it's hard to explain, but it's, it sounds cool, but you just have to be so attuned to it and not necessarily, you know, you let yourself be frustrated almost, you know, you let right. yourself let yourself be baffled and perplexed and not be so bothered by it that you like dismiss it and hate it. Yeah. And I think the one section where it does bog a little bit is that middle section where they are bouncing from island to island to island. And each island visit really takes up like a page, a page and a right. half at, at most. It's so it's, it's yeah. like, you know, where are we going next? Right. But a lot of them are just so weird and so strange. And some of them even laugh out loud funny that it, mm -hmm it makes it worth keep going. And I thought this one was really rewarding. And like I said, I'm really glad we got the opportunity to read the full work here. The yeah. elements of pataphysics section that was excerpted in the big book of SF contains most of the commentary on mathematics, though not all of it. Again, I don't know why they excerpted the material they did, maybe for space reasons or something like that. But the mathematics, I think, is really interesting, both as far as taking the piss out of modern physicists and mathematicians, but also really entertaining these strange spiritualist philosophical ideas through mathematics. He seems both half serious and half mocking in these sections, yeah. and I think it's a really fascinating balance that he strikes here. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like Jari himself would have been a sort of a unsettling person to be around yeah. because you couldn't tell how serious he's being and you know, he might just pull out a gun if you weren't entertaining <laughs> enough. <laughs> so when I said the book smelled funny, like there are certain aspects of it that, that did seem like you're getting a little too close. Like when somebody gets right up in your face and starts talking really weird yeah. and like yeah. maybe spitting a bit and stuff and you're just right. kind of like... Ooh, maybe, yeah, keep your distance just a little bit from me. <laughs> but it was cool. It was confrontational. Yeah. And I, I dug that. So Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I really enjoyed this one a lot. And I think if you enjoy this weird kind of avant-garde writing, you'll find a lot to enjoy here. I know some people on Goodreads that found this novel by like a top 100 science fiction novels you should read before 1920 were disappointed that it wasn't like some fun oh. romp. I didn't know that it had a list like they'd done a list like that, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised. I got to look at that list to see what's on it. Yeah, now. it said like radium era sci-fi novels or something. It was mentioned okay. in one of the Goodreads reviews. But yeah. if you're going into this expecting a typical 1898 style yeah. adventure story, it's you're not an getting adventure that. Story. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, it it resembles some of the traveler type stories that yeah. we've done before in some ways, but it also has so many digressions. Yeah. And those are kind of the most entertaining parts of the book, like right. book six with the, the painting poems. It's just like, I would have happily read more of those actually. Like, oh, absolutely. They, yeah. It was so funny how good those were. Yeah. And, and it almost felt like a, a nice break from, because I, I just couldn't figure out Dr. Faustro and what he was doing, you know, like that whole thing about him 
tearing down the signs on the shops. I'm like, yeah, yeah I get that. I know people who do that. That's right. cool. Yeah. But then all of a sudden he starts murdering people with a yeah. candle and then strangling Boston Oz, who yeah. I thought was his friend. You know, I was like, yeah. what is happening? Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there is not that. Yeah. Like if you're looking for the connecting stuff between some of these events, it'll be hard to find. Yeah. So you just have to, you have to go with it and you have to be willing to accept what Jari gives you. And yeah not be upset about it so that's and that's it's fun it's rewarding there's yeah. a lot of scatological humor a lot and uh <laughs> you can't really go wrong there i guess yeah and i think most of our audience probably knows what kind of books they like and if you're listening to this and you think this sounds really interesting i think you'll probably find it rewarding and if you think it just sounds like a pretentious waste of time then it'll probably be a good one to skip it's hard it's hard to really say more on this yeah like it's something that i think we both agree that we might want to read again. Just... Right. And again, it's the kind of work that's so dense where I think you could easily, if you really wanted to get into the weeds and pull everything apart, you could probably spend an hour or two just digging into one or two chapters. Because yeah. he really does throw a lot at you. Mm -hmm. And the um, chapters are really short. The books yeah. in inside the book are very short. Yeah. It's dense, but brief. So yeah. be prepared for a lot packed into those few pages. And yeah, I I think that I need to take a break now because I feel like I've been sniffing too much ether. So <laughs> All right, well we'll see you in a bit.